Hi, Luke. Hey, what's up? Thanks for indulging. I didn't have anything for lunch today. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe we need to get a snack. Okay. Um, thanks for indulging my request to take over an episode this season. Thank you for taking over. I appreciate you saving the best for last. Mm. Let's toast to that with your chosen beverage. Would you say this Cheers. is... Cheers. Cheers. Is this your favorite? One of my favorites. Gin and tonic. Refreshing. Um, I'd also appreciate if you could introduce my co-host to those who may be watching on video or might hear some um, spontaneous sounds. Uh, our dog, Sai. Is here with us. Is here with us. Being a very His good co-host. boy. He's in cam- I was going to put him behind the camera to run the actual camera and lighting, but you know he didn't really want to do that. He wants to be a star. He wants to be part of the show. He is a star. He is. Okay. In our lives. Yes. So I have promised the listeners that I will deliver an episode of hard-hitting journalism. Yes. I'm prepared to do just that. Wow. So thanks to everyone for sending your questions. Are you ready to dive in? I'm ready for the questions. All of them. Okay. Um, how does it feel to be on the other side of things? It feels good. It's nice and refreshing to not have to do a lot of pre-work. Yeah. Are you feeling relaxed? Yeah. Even in our rewatch episodes, which seem like friends chatting about a movie they just watched, which it is, it's still a lot of prep work, watching the movie, getting the background, fun facts, all those things, getting the intros. So it's nice just to kind of sit back, relax and answer some questions. Are you scared? No. Well, I have, Mm. I've heard some things from some people, so I'm a little scared based on who said that they may have asked questions. Well, I don't want it to be too self-indulgent as well. Okay. Well, you got to just roll with it. Bear with us. I think you're going to do great. Um, How about we kick off with you sharing how did you develop your love for journalism and storytelling? I think it goes back to probably watching Star Wars for the first time. I think everyone has that moment where they watch a movie or they read a book or they listen to music and it immediately ignites imagination. And I think that's probably where we all start as human. That's that's what our gift is, is imagination and thinking of things and telling stories in our heads, whether it's a make believe friend or like me, you were with your brother trying to reenact the Battle of Hoth in snowbanks when you were six, seven years old. So it really started there. And then ever since I was in elementary school, I liked writing stories. I would write short stories, fanfic, probably what it is called now of a character in the Lord of the Rings world, or I would write comic strips, things like that. I was always telling stories. And then when you get older in elementary school, you have creative writing projects. And I remember one time I I wrote a story and it did well enough where I was able to actually share it in front of the class. Like I had to go and actually read an excerpt of my story. Terrifying. And and I wasn't that terrified because I was pretty proud, but that was probably the beginning where I knew telling stories was something that not only was I halfway decent at, but I really loved doing and I wanted to do in some capacity the rest of my life. Hmm. How did you translate that into podcasting? Were you scouted for having the perfect voice? Uh, Yeah. Voice for radio face, uh, not for TV. That started actually with friend of the pod, Zach Hall. We started a podcast in, I think we started in 2014, 2013. So this is still before this is before serial so this is before the podcast boom and we had a podcast called two beers two nerds where as the title says you have two nerds drinking two beers talking about a subject Mm -hmm. Uh, and i had my background was in video i did a lot of video production so podcasting essentially was like video production but you don't have to use the cameras uh so it was easier Mm -hmm. and that's a lot of time where talking podcast became popular so that's how it translated just to do it for fun. And then like a lot of art podcasting is affordable or it was affordable back then it was cheaper. Mm -hmm. If I had all the video equipment, I maybe would have started a YouTube channel, but even back in 2013, iPhone video wasn't that good of quality. So podcasting was just, Hey, it's, it's affordable. Made sense. I can do it. It's a creative outlet. And then after college, we moved to Grand Rapids, my hometown and I was really involved in the city and my work and what I was doing in my day job. And then I started a podcast with 
my good friend Tiffany. And we did a podcast called I Heart Grand Rapids, which was just a local meet and greet podcast, community podcast. So, and that was really fun. That was a running gun. So I, I remember biking through the city. I'd have audio equipment in my backpack and I would bike from work to whoever we were interviewing in the city on my lunch break, meet up with Tiffany and set it all up and have conversations. It was a really good learning lesson, but a lot of fun. So that's really how it transitioned into podcasting. And then it's just a love affair mm -hmm. since then. Was that the period of time that you were hit by a bus on your bike? I was hit by a bus on my bike. Obviously you're okay. I'm okay. <laughs> it's <laughs> delay. Yeah, that, that was a, that was an eye opening moment. Literally. I actually, I was hit twice. Uh, you know what? This is too scary for the moms. The moms <laughs> are going to listen and they don't want to talk about this. Basically, long story short, don't listen to music while you're biking. It's just not safe. Yeah. You we've think lived you, and we've you, learned. You think you can cut corners and go out in back alleys, but cars don't see you. Buses don't see you. Mm -hmm. Not all of us are Joseph Gordon-Levitt. No, in, in that bike movie. Whatever that's called. But I'm still on the mic today, so thankful. Survivor. Yes. Um, so where do your interests stem from? And where does your endless curiosity come from? Endless curiosity. That's part of, I think, being a creative person. And I believe everybody's creative, but I think if you're in the creative arts or you have a creative practice more in more than the traditional sense, there's a longing for what's out there for possibilities. And I don't, I don't really, I guess I am curious. I never really thought of that as being curious, but I think that's just part of my imagination. That's how I think about it more as imagination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's more entering that world of my brain and imagination and creating things and exploring things in my head. And that involves into curiosity, but um, imagination is, I think, the deeper root of the curiosity. Do you find yourself to be an inquisitive person? Inquisitive is such a uh, nice word. Yeah, we had some very um, well-written questions well -written questions. In. I think I'm curious about people. Going back to the curious word, I think I'm inquisitive about people and stories. That's why the podcast is called Least Important Things, because it's really about things that don't matter. I've done podcasts, again, I did a more of a civic podcast. I've done more serious work in my past, but it's really about the silly things in life, the things that don't really matter, but actually matter. They make me curious and excited mm. and inquisitive. Uh, as you get older, there, you know, things, life becomes harder. Maybe you're not as passionate about the things you were when you were in your early 20s. Hmm. but I kind of go back to like what makes me happy as a child, what got me excited as a child. And those were the things like movies, broadcasting, sports, television, mm -hmm. things like that, that music that attracts me. Mm -hmm. And it's the stories around it. That's how people connect. There's an episode coming up. That's really exciting for lit about a listener. Is this a, a this is a hot, hot take. Vivi, who lives in Switzerland, and we talk about she had never seen Indiana Jones before, mm. and we kind of do a before and after episode. But we were talking, and I don't know if this will make the episode, but we were talking about how cool it is with technology, obviously, but you can connect with somebody across the world just because you're talking about a movie. And I yeah. think that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to the least important things. It doesn't really matter like that there's so much bigger things in our lives and more important things in our lives, but to be able to have connection like that through an art form like movies or TV or music. I think that's where you see the good side of the internet and technology is mm -hmm. people being able to connect that way. Yeah. Old internet stuff. Yeah. What, Instagram what it is. Instagram meetups. Yeah. Instagram meetups, all the good stuff. Um, I love it. We have so many questions. So I have to just yeah, I know. keep plowing through. I know. So do you identify as a procrastinator? And would you view procrastination as a positive or a negative thing? I'm not a procrastinator. Sometimes I have to give myself deadlines to get the work done. I think procrastination can be a superpower. One of my best lifelong friends, Paul Knapp, is a professional procrastinator. He needs the last second deadline and the adrenaline of that last moment to do the work. He's the guy in college that would do all of his work like the night before and still like somehow get a three point in a paper. 
I'm not like that because I'm not, I'm not, I need to have a little bit more structure, but I think it is a superpower. I think I'm becoming or realizing that I'm a procrastinator. Yeah. Not in everything, but like Some this things, episode. Yeah, for like instance. pushing off this episode. Yeah. And that's why we couldn't have an actual weekly co host of podcast for I Married once, an Artist fans, RIP. Mm-hmm. That's why we couldn't because I'm a little bit more of, I'm a little bit more just of ascendant mentality. Mm hmm. And that's because I'm in the marketing world, the content marketing world where it's like, you just got to ship and make and create. And that's more, I I like to just think about that way. Like the grind of just like producing. I love that. Yeah. You're the person like you wake up every morning and you sit down at your desk. Yeah. And I just want to create every day. Even if it's not this perfect thing, I like just getting it out, anything, everything. I just love that task. And that comes back to that journalism aspect we talked about and that's more of a romanticism version of journalism i didn't have a traditional journalism career even though i studied it but there is that aspect of historical journalism it was actually a look down upon job it was a very much a low income earning job always has been Mm. Uh, even though we have these movies in the 70s like all the president's men that glorify it the newsroom like things like that that glorify journalism but it's always been a blue collar grinded out type of profession and i i really love the grind so i'm not a procrastinator but it is a superpower Put that on a bumper sticker so it's a superpower for those who have it and i would say if you have it use it and know and know that you have it and then use it to your advantage that's wonderful i think i'm realizing that i'm the type of person that wakes up and really craves that slow morning and then i indulge in it and also inevitably create a sense of like dread and anxiety at the time it's that hard. I've wasted. Yeah, that's, it's hard, but I, it, I'm doing the, the same thing. I always, every time I walk by construction crews, I feel guilty. I told that to my therapist one time and she's like, why? Because I just, I've never had a, and this is probably comes from a, uh, patriarchal manhood kind of thing, but I've never had, I like, I know like, or even just people who work at a restaurant, like it's like they, 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 they really, they show up and they're doing so, so hard work. And so I have always tried to draw that into my work because I know it's a privilege to be able to do this, even if I get paid or not paid for it, to be able to do it and have the freedom to do it. You, do you, are you talking about like the difference between more of like a physical manual yeah, job? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think too, something that probably feeds into that is that you work completely alone even in this and then even in things that you do outside of least important things where you've been a remote worker for four years and on a team that doesn't exist in real life. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's or in person. It's scary. You have when your world it might make it feel like it's not as solid of a thing. Yeah. When your world is virtual di- digit, like it's zeros and ones and pixels Mm -hmm. like that's your world that's not the same as when you witness people working on a construction site which is going to be or making the breakfast taco like that's like Mm -hmm. it's tangible results there teamwork yeah and teamwork yeah which you you are good at yeah i can attest and that's why i force my friends to come on my podcast and new friends Mm -hmm. uh so if you're out there if you're a listener that you know me or only know me through this podcast my goal and always goal has been to make episodes together so if you have something that's in the least important things umbrella which is really anything reach out let's just have a conversation that's what vivi and i did for this upcoming episode we just had a question yeah, we but, just had you know, a conversation that's and nice can... that you say that but it's not as easy as you make it sound i've been trying to get on for months maybe a year you know, some of us yeah, have you got been... to see, you got to pitch me something. You gotta I know get, it, did take it, me, it took me a while to come up with my idea. See, that's the thing. I'm more of a ship it. Like if I, if I have an idea, I, I would rather just like go see it through and just yeah. get it out. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a slow burn. Yeah. Um, enough about me. Next question. Here we go. Sort of, sort of a, um, statement and a question. Yeah. So, you know, it's fun to discuss the top movies and books of all time amongst other things. Do you feel that any of these can be definitively selected? No. And that's the best part of it, right? That's why barbershop conversations Mm -hmm. are the best because, and I did an episode about the greatest of all time, greatest of all time debates, because it's in the debate and conversation 
that's where the entertainment is and that's where the fun is. Well, agreed. So why don't you tell us your list of top five movies of all time right now, just in the moment. So there's, so mm, th- yes, yeah, see, this is where it gets complicated because it's like, is, say, it, is it my subjective, like Luke's, let's like, say Luke's, my let's letterbox? Say Luke's subjective because, um, that's what we're here to do. Okay. So to subjective. Talk about you. And the way I view greatest of all time is not, it's not just technical or prowess or awards. It's for me, it's rewatchability, nostalgic connection. Do I have a connection to the film so entertainment? Really value. you're describing favorites. So let's go with yeah, favorites. favorites. So, so like, what are your, let's just, and they don't have to be the top, but why don't you just like, what comes to mind? Star Five. Wars. Well, you have to be more specific. The original Star Wars. Which episode? Star Wars A New Hope. Okay. Did, was that even a correct like thing that I said? It's okay. Depends, okay. depends on your age. I apologize. <laughs> Jaws. Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay. The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, Dark Knight. Mm. Great lineup. I mean. It's very pop culture. It's very of Spielberg, Lucas. Interesting you didn't really put any um, dramas in there. No, it's not. I have like, that's more the intellectual side Mm -hmm. of like on Letterboxd. If you follow me on Letterboxd, Luke H. Ferris. You can see I have a list. I have my hundred and it's going to be end up being 200 favorites that are more of this kind of list. Yeah. And then I have film school favorites. So the dramas that you maybe don't want to rewatch all the time, but like you have a visceral experience mm-hmm. where it, we were talking about this the other day when we saw Perks of Being the Wallflower, we saw it at our campus theater, which was essentially a red box. Yeah, it wasn't a theater. It was a lecture hall. It was a lecture hall, but they they would play DVDs. Yeah, they would screen films that hadn't come to DVD rental, but had been out of theater. So it was that in between back in the day. So almost like what streaming is today now. It was so fun. We we believe we're trying to reminisce. I think we we went with our our good friend Spencer Elliott. Shout out to Spencer. And I remember we were walking back from the theater, and we all three of us were just speechless like it was it was one of the most powerful experiences we've ever had now i think perks can be a rewatchable movie but man that's it's tough that's a doozy yeah so it's it's movies like that that you have an experience that you remember Mm -hmm. i I think also last and or like when we talk about that's not in your top five no it's not honorable mention yeah well perks of being a wallflower is a movie adaptation of a book which you haven't read no but it's on our shelf and we, I really think you should read it. Sometimes you're just like, I don't really, I'm not ready to the get into the emotions. It's a super be... quick read and it's really interesting because the whole book is um, in letter format. Right. So I think, because you're not really one to read fiction, but I think you'd be able to digest that. Um, great segue, if I do say so myself, to your top five favorite books. That's, that's good. I actually had to write this one down because I had to think through it, so... Bear with me, because I, I know, I did know this one was this is coming. A, f- a family of note takers. It is, and and journal takers. So, Lord of the Rings. Th- this is tough, because do you want me to like? To me, the 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 Tolkien canon is number one. You can call that one. Okay. Because you only get five. It's 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 probably for me. It's one of the most important texts in my life. I go back to it. I as I've gotten older, it's become more important. 1776, David McCullough, one of the greatest historical writers of all time. Holes. Wow. Just at, like that. I remember reading that book in fourth grade and it absolutely changed my whole perspective and mm. just absolutely stayed with me. And that was before the film came out. What's your big takeaway from Holes? I'm still struck with the eating of the onions. Yeah. Like, I, think I can't forget it, about it's that. It's almost a fantastical story. Like it, it feels like a fantasy w- mm-hmm. world. Like this, it's not in our world, but it's well, yeah. Nobody would send their kid to go dig holes. Like and that's it, not yeah, happening. It's, it's it definitely, it feels fantastical okay, that sorry. way. So uh, that's so two. 17, six holes, Lord of the oh, Rings, three. Fahrenheit 451. Mm-hmm. I still think when you talk about high school, it's funny. Cause I, you know, storyteller writer i actually wasn't i didn't like english very much i thought i i I almost tended to be this like uh class clown because i was always i i got especially in high school i I was put up in the the ap english and i was not that smart and i was i would just kind of be like uh this is stupid but fahrenheit 451 
you read that in school and you liked it. You that, that changed my life. Wow. That one. Just incredible. Bold statement. And then I think there's like a bunch of like fifth, uh, fifth place, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, John le Carre, who I've, I've come later in life. So that's where I, it, it didn't have a childhood impact, but later in life, British spy novels, absolutely amazing. And then some honorable mentions, Dracula, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Hound of the Baskervilles, Sherlock Holmes, of course, and K- Kitchen Confidential by Anthony Bourdain. Wow. And Dune. You got to put Dune in there. So Ooh. not really top five, but the, that I had to list a few. I think that gives the people what they wanted. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another listener question was about the books that were behind me on the shelf. Yes. I think this is from Greg Jackson. Correct. In the video that I made Friend for, <laughs> yes, for your Instagram. So Greg is wondering how many of the books in the video were mine and how many were yours specifically requesting a percentage and I think it's important to explain that that is only like a third of the book collection yeah what's on display is not the full collection there I have a lot of all my graphic novels are in my closet and so So why don't we say what's on display how much how many are yours and how many are mine you can give a percentage I think it's probably 60 60 40 who's 60 you're 60 yeah my books are bigger I think it might be like closer to, well, maybe 60, 40. My, some From, of my books are bigger, just like the historical books and then the Tolkien illustrated special editions. I mean, I've got a lot of art books. That's true. Those are big. I think that to answer Greg's question, the shelf I was sitting in front of is probably more dominantly yours. And then I right. kind of have one that's right. more dominantly mine. One but of our, it's a big blend and it's not organized in any way. No, that's why it's one of our favorite party tricks. If people come over and hang out for the first time, I always like to ask, like, can you tell which books are mine or which ones are Audrey's? And it's always a fun little game that we play. I think it's an easy game. It's pretty obvious. You read nonfiction and I read fiction. I've been on a fiction run for the summer, so reading a lot of pulp novels. I feel like we meet in the middle at the memoir. Yeah. Well, yeah, I like a memoir. Would, yeah. I have, I mean, I guess Obama's is a memoir. True. Promised Land is a memoir. True. That's good. That gives me a lot of pages. If we're talking pages, that one, that one gives me a lot. That's a one. That one gives me a lot. Yeah, you do. I'm looking at them right now. Some of yours are um, quite thick. Yes. Okay, so you've lived in Chicago for a year now. Yes. If you can hear the CTA, and if you can hear the CTA in our, in our episodes, specifically the rewatch episodes, you can probably hear the CTA. The CTA is the um, train, train that we live. Chicago Transit Authority. That goes through right behind our backyard. So we don't really hear it, but it I'm sure probably listeners. does pick up. Um, so what has that been like for you living here for a year? Um, and what have you not done yet that you're looking forward to? It's been remarkable. I've always wanted to live in the city, especially I grew up in Michigan. And Michigan's a weird place because... Detroit's the big city, but if you lived in places like Grand Rapids and Traverse City, where I lived, it wasn't right next door. Um, Grand Rapids, where I was born, I, li- I grew up in Traverse City, but Grand Rapids is about halfway between Chicago and Detroit. Mm-hmm. It's like two hours each way, depending on traffic. So I actually spent more time going to Detroit growing up uh, because Detroit sports fan, you know, had had friends there. But in college, I started coming to Chicago more for work and work opportunities and really fell in love with the city. And then tied with my favorite movies, when The Dark Knight came out, filmed in Chicago, there's a lot of great Chicago films. Obviously, John Hughes, you know, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, we have, I mean, one of the best. We have a, a pop art of a scene from that movie hanging up from my good friend Melissa. But The Dark Knight, like shooting in Chicago I remember just like thinking about that and like every time I would drive to the city it would just the soundtrack I would play the soundtrack and so being here for a year is just like a remarkable I'm just so thankful to be here and I would love to live here as long as I can and there's so much to do uh thankfully we've been to a lot of great music venues this past year for, finally went to Soldier Field for a Chicago Fire game uh, with my friend Ross and your dad actually so I'm, I, I think can't I think it's just probably food. Like there's so much good food. There's so many good family spots in Chicago and dive spots. I think that's probably what we haven't done. Mm -hmm. We haven't done like the Hyde Park 
neighborhood. We, we need to explore a little bit more neighborhoods. Chinatown. Chinatown. So I think it's just exploring more neighborhoods, dive spots. And then, yeah, we're on the you north know, I'd, side lo- I'd love to be an extra on Chicago Fire or Chicago PD or The Bear. That's another one of my goals before those shows end. That was just a gorgeous segue into my next question, even though I kind of wanted to keep talking about that, but I, I can't resist. Speaking of Chicago, you're a fan of the TV show, The Bear, as you just mentioned. So we had a listener that commented saying they never remember or even pay attention to the names of TV episodes, but with watching The Bear, they can remember the name of every episode, which is kind of interesting. So it's, that's not really a question, but which are your favorite episodes and why? Do you know the names of the episodes? I think for a lot of people, season two, I think Fishes is, is the iconic name that people remember. And then. And that's one of your favorites. Yeah, I think that was. And I, I'll have ca- caveat on this. Definitely not my experience, but it was the. And I've talked to people about this. If you grew up with a family that talks loud, there's a lot of you in a small, confined space talking over to each other because you're excited to be together. I felt like fishes captured that more than anything I've ever seen in movies or TV. You felt like you were watching, not necessarily a scene that ever played out in your life. No, it never got that intense, but it, but it was like, Oh, this is, this is the noise level of a family holiday event of my entire life. Or even just some of the emotions of like, you know, a little bit of stress, excitement, a little bit of conflict. Yeah. Or was it not so much that it was more like the the pace and the sound? The pace, the sound. There was never that much conflict, but uh, there's a scene where Carmi and his siblings are out smoking on their porch, and you know the snow's falling, and there's that quietness of just like. And I remember when that episode came out, texting my sister Eliza and just saying, "Man, I feel that. Mm-hmm. That's us. Uh, that's the two of you. That's us taking a break from." the family, Mm -hmm. which I think for us was probably not smoking cigarettes outside. was probably watching the Jonas Brothers show or Sweet Life (laughs) of Zack and Cody. (laughs) Your family's also like, you guys were like big hot tub people. Yeah. Which has always been really interesting to me. Yeah. I've never known hot tub people before, but that's sort of like, that's where everybody like takes a minute, goes outside, like you're saying, like in the winter, get in the hot tub relax shut up laugh laugh chill you do that with your sister right. Right? so yes yeah, so fish is definitely one of the most powerful episodes of television i've ever seen you know so you, and then the i don't know the name of the finale of or the um the second to last episode of season one where they're in the kitchen and um the online order goes oh, haywire oh, and yeah, they yeah. just it comes through and then the underlying song of that is a Wilco song, which is one of my favorite bands. And it's like this really like deep cut song that only like fans know. Cause there's a lot of like cacophony and noise through that sound. Then I just couldn't, I just couldn't believe that they added that song in that element and just like chaos. It's just so good. And then to end season one on a Radiohead song, it's just, it's why, I, it's why I didn't want them to, to make a second season, but I'm really glad they did because we got fishes. Agreed. And spoons is the other big one. So the food on the bear is a main focus. Yes, it's a food show. If you are what you eat, what are you? It's a great question. chips and salsa yeah probably chips and salsa <laughs> i was gonna say cereal but i have I, I had a, I've, I've cut back as i've gotten older uh cereal or chips and salsa salty or sweet salty but not personality wise no no okay so if you could have four characters from the jurassic franchise over for dinner yeah who would you pick yeah this is lydia shout out to lydia out in the uk another one of uh listener that was connected through my every, we'll get there uh, okay we'll get there <laughs> so shout out to lydia <laughs> she's awesome great question so I, I listed this one out and i i thought about this question a lot so obviously if you know if you listen to any episode of jurassic pod ian malcolm of course 
Ellie Sadler, Dr. Ellie Sadler, ha- got to have her. So those two are great. And then, uh, then I thought, uh, Lowry from Jurassic World, which if you know me is pretty, but he's played by Jake Johnson, which would be great. And then Arnold who is played by Sam Jackson. I think it's a nice balance. Jake Johnson. Yes. Who is that? He plays Nick on new girl. He's on Jurassic park. He's in Jurassic world and they didn't bring him back. Did I see that movie? Probably not. Well, yeah, yeah, you, it was you and Shannon were on the episode. Of course I remember that, but I don't remember Jake. Johnson. Yeah. He's like one of the like tech guys. Oh, wow. Yeah. So Ian, Ian must, Malcolm, Ellie Sadler, re-watch. Lowry and Arnold. He'd probably just be smoking in the corner. I wish I could respond to that, but I don't know who they are. So okay. that's great. Um, speaking of movies, what would your starting 11 be if all the players were characters from movies? And also, what is that? Thank you, Tucker. Tucker sent this question in. And I did spend, I think, two hours last Saturday morning. And it's it's Trying like scratched out in question? my notebook. I So... I tried to source from the rewatch series we do on Lit. So we've rewatched Jurassic Parks, all the franchise. We've rewatched all the Mission Impossibles, and we're currently finishing out the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. So I tried to draw them in. Um, starting 11 is a soccer term, so it's just your starting lineup, and there's 11 players on the soccer field. So it's first string. Your first string. Okay, I'll run this. Are you th- going to go through positions? Yeah, I'll run through this fast. Oh, God. We're, gonna do, we're playing a 4 3 3. Of course, in goal, we're going to have Jar Jar Binks. You know, he's going to be able to jump fast, he's quick, That's he's got really great good. reflexes. Um, and then, you know, on our back four, our center backs, we're going to have uh, Aragorn, LSR, and Luther from Mission Impossible, two like strong, um, morally conscious. Uh, well, they'll probably be co captains, just holding holding the back down. Gorgeous. And then on the wings, um, uh, on the left wing, we're going to have Blade. Um, and then on the right wing, we're going to have Furiosa. We're ha- it's really my offense is all about speed and attacking and driving, but I also need them to be able to cover a lot of ground. I think Blade's going to cover a lot of ground, aggressive. Furiosa, she, she's tall, she's fast, and she's going to just get the job done. Um, we're going to be very aggressive. Wow. And then my, in my midfield, I need that solidity. I need someone who's um, strong, but also smart. Mm. So uh, my defensive midfielder is Dr. Ellie Sadler, as I mentioned, she's coming over for dinner later. Um, so <laughs> to it, celebrate uh, the game, she's right there in the middle. And then uh, paired, we have two attacking midfielders, Ethan Hunt. He's getting all the plans together. He's seen, he's seen the lanes. He's making the passes. And then John Wick. I need someone who can dribble through defenses and get through a crowd. We think about John Wick. He's able to like fight through the, a mass of people. He's going to be able to super intimidating, intense. He's going to be able to play through and dribble through uh, a defense that's going to bunker down. Yes. Okay. Then our attackers, <laughs> we have uh, Jack Sparrow on, on the left wing. Interesting. Now people would th- think that's a crazy choice, but I'm all about creativity and spontaneity. And that's what Jack Sparrow is. He's able to make something out of nothing and you can't predict what he's going to do. You really can't predict. And I have Furiosa covering him. So she's going to be stable and strong. And then Jack can just do his Jack Sparrow stuff. I don't know if she's going to be happy about that. She's not, but she'll, she'll be able to handle it. Okay. And then uh, um, on the right wing, I need someone who's going to drive uh, as an attacker, who's going to cut through lanes, um, who's not going to stop for people and is a, a killer finisher. So I'm going to have Maxine uh, as, as, my le- as my right w- or left winger. I l- actually wondered if you were going to pick her. Yeah, so she's, she's going to get the job done. Um, and she's aggressive. And, you know, when you want attackers, you want attackers who are confident and know what they're going for. Mm. And then up top, as our striker, we want someone who's strong, who's stable, who's stoic, and um, great at, you know, finishing and killing and killing it. Michael Myers, uh, the shape, as my striker. Uh, our manager, we want someone who's going to be um, is this part of the 11? Yeah, young and upcoming. So I'm going to have Harrison Ford's Jack Ryan. I think he's very strategic, smart, more of like a, a Pep Guardiola, like Jurgen Klopp, younger. Um, and then um, for the commentators, we're going to have... No, this is... You're going with... <laughs> Play-by-play is going to be Benji. And then color, color commentator is going to be Ian Malcolm. Thank you, Tucker. That was a really good question. I'm trying to think if I, like you missed anybody that I think would be crucial so i'm really bummed because he did say movie originally my entire team was uh was built around sydney bristow oh i got one which is jennifer gardner and alias because i she was gonna be my my wing back oh but that's tv yeah so i I had to take her out but my entire team was built around her so i had to restart this whole thing 
maybe as like a um, sub or whatnot for Maxine, Harley Quinn. Harley Similar Quinn energy. would be really good. Similar energy. Yeah, that I love that. I'm also thinking about Ray from Star Wars. Ray from Star Wars would be great too. She's very strong. She's very strong. Yeah, she would be. And focused. She'd be a great winger as well. Okay. That was a really good answer. Thank you for spending, yeah. what did you say, two hours working Two hours, that? yeah. Like, I had it, and then I was like, oh, Sydney, Sydney Bristow, and then I was like, oh, she's a TV, and then I had to restart my entire formation, because it was all built around her. My offense was all built around her. I feel like this is going to be something that will serve you in another time and place. I'm glad you have this down. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Tucker. Um, okay. You can see one song performed live by the original artist, Dead or Alive. What song do you pick? I think it's easy to say Led Zeppelin, Immigrant Song, you know, those iconic bands or artists, Prince or Michael Jackson, Spirit of the Radio by Rush, you know, all those bands who have either members have passed or they've passed away. It's easy to say that. I'm going to give two. It would be seeing Daft Punk playing Alive. But really, my answer, and I, and I, well, you got to do a song. Alive by Daft Punk. The song oh, Alive oh, by Daft I Punk. Oh, I didn't understand. Okay. For me, it would be the the main one would be Hotel, Hotel Yorba by the White Stripes. Why do you think that buzzword phrases occur? Do you have favorites and or any that you love to hate? If anybody who has worked with me professionally, I love talking about buzzwords. I hate buzzwords and, and love them at the same time. I, it's, why do you think they occur? Because we need uniform language to communicate. And I think we mirror as humans. Mm-hmm. So one of the big buzzwords in a culture that I actively work in my head not to say is vibe. Same. Vibration. Same. My dad has gotten to a point of calling me out when I use that or word. Or 100%. That's another big one. What about... a? Th- thousand percent which i think podcasts actually are are making this phenomenon happen more because we are unconsciously listening to podcasts and if everyone is saying vibe and 100 percent in their answers right it it happens even faster than it would just normally based off of television because there's so much media so would those be some that you love to hate yeah but i'm also fascinated by buzzwords every industry has their own buzzwords corporate culture has their own buzzwords I don't know if this is a buzzword, but there is one thing you say all the time that it must be your favorite. Do you know what I'm going to say? Fired up. Yes. Yeah. Ever, it's always, oh, he's fired up. And that, there's, and that's a more of a family colloquialism. So there's family buzzwords that everyone says, or you grew up saying with your family or you say it for, and it's, it's fascinating. I love talking about the English language and those things. Do I have any that you think I say often? Da, 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 da. So, so instead of doing the yada, yada, yada from Seinfeld, Audrey does da, 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 da. So she's telling a story, she'll say, and then da, 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 da. And then I went here. It's, it's so a, it's strange. A, it's, an, it's a, it's a, a verbal so ellipsis. I'm so unaware that I right. do it. Do I have any other ones? This is like really interesting to me. No one else is probably interested, but. Buzzword. No, I don't, I don't think so. Vibe, unfortunately. I think I We all do it. That. We all say it. Um, and we're actually working not to say it. Okay, great. So speaking of favorites, who are your favorite people that live in the state of Virginia? (laughs) (laughs) I am officially redacting myself from this question because it is a trap. The entire Till family. Well, that's fine. It says favorite people. It doesn't say person. Well, technically, technically Uncle Mike and Aunt Stephanie are the only ones that live in Virginia proper right okay. now. So okay. I would so say Mike an... and Stephanie Till okay. so are my favorite. Okay, don't be scared. Yeah, okay. Don't be shy. That, well, was a trap qu- that was a trick question. The follow-up is, um, who would be your favorite member of the Till family <laughs> of Mike and Stephanie in Virginia? These were submitted... Very specific These were questions, questions submitted by family members unbeknownst to each other, I think. I think it was separate, but I feel there's collusion and I'm being put in a awkward so position. So is that the question that you're saying I you will can't not, answer? No. But what have you had to? My favorite Till living in Maryland is Josie Till. Okay, so it sounds like you picked Josie because you no, pointed her out. No, my favorite Till living in the District of Columbia is Olivia Till. And my favorite Till living in the country of New Zealand is Henry Till. And I do think we owe him a, a birthday, a happy, happy birthday. birthday. 
Hank. And uh, happy early birthday, Josie. Okay, so now let's get into it. This is what everybody's been waiting for this. What Sex in the City character do you identify most with? And who would be your rising character? I think everybody that's in my position, being a white straight man that has seen the show, that has either been brought into the culture and the community, a lot of us aspire want to be a Steve or a Harry. You know, Steve, you got mm-hmm. Brooklyn, blue collar, great guy, even though he loves hard. Loves hard, passionate, good dad. You know, Harry, you know, New York, Jewish lawyer. Like You can say all the same things. All the great things. Like loyal, smart, got a great career. A lot of the same qualities between the two. Both great, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Just you know, different, Steve, different Steve's a bar, owns a bar. I mean, I mean, we would all want to be them. Unfortunately, because of my body type, being 6'5", I am definitely more of an Aiden. Why is that unfortunate? Well, I, uh, you know, I actually like Aiden. Aiden. Okay. I like Aiden. I'm 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 an Aiden burger hybrid, unfortunately. So you're an Aiden with a burger rising. Yeah, <laughs> I'm an Aiden with a burger rising. What's the burger connection? Because he's a writer and he's angsty and you're not angsty. Yeah, but he's kind you of like do he's, use, you use a lot of post-it notes. Post-it notes. I've just, I, I probably, I probably act like him more than the other characters. You know, he's very successful. He does have a house in the Hamptons, well, which that's is true. extremely confusing to us all of how he has so, that. So Aiden Berger rising, I'd like it to be a Smith Jared rising uh, because I like his aura. I think he's very and calm his and his body. Beauty. <laughs> but it's really his aura. Like that's Smith Jared's aura is probably one of my. I do think you have some Smith Jared in you. You know, he's very loyal caretaking i speak as a spouse who was just totally ravaged by uh some food poisoning last weekend which we don't need to get into but no we don't need to get into that i can't help but make the comparison between samantha's cancer battle <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> <my> food poisoning. <laughs> well if it gives me the smith jared no you were an amazing nurse it, you were so. an amazing nurse okay Okay, so that's a great Aiden answer. Aiden Burger Rising, sorry. Wait, what about Smith Jared? Aiden Burger, Smith Jared Rising. Is his name Smith Jared? Yeah. Okay, just like, sounds so weird. I don't feel like I ever <laughs> refer to him in general. Um, can you explain why multiple listeners sent in that question and what your connection to the Sex and the City franchise is, as well as, well, and then a follow-up question do you have any public apologies that you'd like to make on this subject? This feels like a question that was embedded here by the producer. I think it's important. People are probably like, you've never spoken about Sex in the City before. Why are we talking about this? I have on episodes mentioned Sex in the City. So we were on a podcast as guests called Every Outfit, an amazing podcast that's a pop culture hybrid rewatch podcast of Sex in the City. You started listening to it, and it provoked us to rewatch the whole series, which I'd never seen from start to finish. I think I'd seen one or two of the movies and a smattering of episodes. Mm -hmm. And going through that whole series from start to finish, unequivocally, one of the best shows of all time from a writing standpoint. like It is such a strong writer's-focused, like character-driven show and so smart and savvy. So that's really what the connection was. And then I reached out to this podcast because you challenged me to reach out to them on their voicemail. And I did. What? I had an opinion about, hey, they should talk about Seinfeld. This this is crazy. I'm really glad that this is all um, getting put down in history. Yeah. So you challenged me. You were like, well, if you have an opinion and you have a question, you should just reach out to them. And I did kind of unknowing to you and then they came back and we got to be on that I guess maybe I don't remember that yeah yeah because I was I was talking about you know what no one's talking about is Elaine's fashion on Seinfeld and you're like well you should reach out to them and I was like okay well and I did it you know what and then I, we were on the episode I could and then, be so blinded by um jealousy whatever you want to call it that I don't remember that but I do trust you I just said that you're loyal um, and Steve or, uh, uh, Smith Jared asks, so I shouldn't doubt you, but I have no memory of that. 
my memory is I'm a loyal listener and fan. I listen weekly. And one week, I hear your voice on my favorite podcast. It was very jarring for me. And then you did become somewhat of a, uh, what would you say? Lore. I was part of, I, like, you could look me up in their their wiki. If, if every, I don't even know if every outfit has a wiki, but they, they probably could. I would be just like a subcategory reference, but I... It was a very surreal experience. Yeah. So, and Lydia, Vivi started listening to the show because of that. So thank you guys. Okay. So no apologies to me. I apologize for my wife for steamrolling and gaslighting her favorite podcast. I apologize. It's okay. It wasn't my intention. It's been a few years and I am over it. She's over it. So we can open the door back up. It was an exciting time. To Chelsea and Lauren. And me being part of their world, maybe. Okay. You know what? You just need to... They've got other things to worry about. No, they love you, but just let me have my thing, you know? Yes. You know how it is. It's tough. Podcast. I'm a podcaster. I love to podcast. Now we're going to head into the rapid fire section. Are you ready? I'm ready. And these are just going to be all across the board and we're just going to go. I like it. Quick. It seems that hard currency is being used less and less. Venmo, PayPal, online credit cards are the way that we purchase things today. Do you see this as the possible demise of the luck we once experienced from found pennies? This is either from your dad or my brother-in-law, Danny. It doesn't matter. (laughs) (laughs) It's from my dad. Okay. (laughs) I think it's a great question. (laughs) You know, I... What was I'm reading this may be way off track, but I'm reading the novelization of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and where they essentially they used to have these with movies. They used to have novelizations of, of movies. That this was is a, supposed to be rapid fire. Part of a marketing. <laughs> it's part of a marketing tactic for films. You're for really a long time. good at talking. And Quentin Tarantino decided to actually write one of these books kind of in homage because the movie's all about the 1960s and 70s in Hollywood. Anyways, they're describing the scene where Margot Robbie's character playing Sharon Tate goes to the theater to watch her own movie and the ticket cost is 75 cents and she reached, they, you know, he writes in the book, she reached down to find three quarters and I was like, wow, that would be nice to just like look down in your purse or your wallet and be like, oh, I got a couple quarters. I can go see a movie. So I miss that tactileness of money. Do you see this as the possible demise of the luck you once experienced from found pennies? The luck? I, I don't know. I make my own luck. Wow. You heard it here. Okay. (laughs) What are your thoughts regarding the movie Twister, the Helen Hunt version? A great film. I'm glad it's getting its due because of the sequel. I think the marketing done by the whole Twisters sequel is brilliant. And it's giving this original film that was a 90s blockbuster, kind of this pure original story that's fun, disaster movie more and more recognition for its staying power. What do you think about 4D? 4D? Uh, It's a gimmick. I'm a a traditionalist. I don't like... Have you ever experienced it? Yeah, I think Disney World. I think the Muppets 4D I enjoyed. I remember as a kid. (laughs) The Muppets 4D. (laughs) Okay, that sounds fun. Original Twisters movie, one of the best like TBS, TNT, Saturday afternoon movies that you can flip back and forth from a sporting event or another movie. Uh, it's a great basic cable mm. movie to have on. Great. In your opinion, what is the worst holiday? To clarify, this does not mean it is your least favorite. It could be the worst and still be your favorite. It's a great question. The answer is Christmas. The worst holiday. I think it is the worst holiday. It puts so much pressure on people to show up on a certain day, the 25th of December, and, and be in multiple places. And be in multiple once. places at once. But it's also a great holiday. Like the season is really special and people love it. And it's but it's it's the worst holiday because of that because it, there's a requirement on a specific day. Thanksgiving is Thanksgiving is much more relaxed. Yeah, the day of Thanksgiving is the day, but also like, you know, it's that weekend. You can show up on Friday. There's no rules. Fourth of July. Yeah, Fourth of July, that's when the fireworks go off. But that weekend you can show up at a party, you can hang out with your family whenever, you know. It's all red, white, and blue. So I think there's just so much pressure on Christmas, and that's why it's the worst holiday. Totally. 
Christmas is the worst. If you could pick someone to play you in a movie about your life, who would it be? I definitely don't have a life worth of a film. That's not the question. This is aspirational. You don't have to even feel like, oh, I'm saying that this person looks like... It's like, who do you want to harness your I think, livelihood? I think Gosling probably for me because oh. I think he can play serious and goofy. And I think that's probably a lot of my personality. I have probably had this intensity and this goofiness and everything in between. And also there's, like, I think all of Gosling's movies and characters he portrays, there's like a soft tenderness to him. Even in like some of his more intense indie roles, there's I a softness. Agree. That wasn't who I thought you were going to say, but I like it. What is your stance on what to call your in-law's spouse? So let me explain this. I have a sister. You and I are married. So my sister is your sister-in-law. But what would you call her husband? He's my brother-in-law. He's my sister's husband. But what is he to you? A guy. <laughs> is that, he your brother-in-law? Yeah. You call him yeah, your brother-in-law? Absolutely. Do you think that's correct or is I that think just that's, convenient? I think that's legally correct because it's through marriage. Anytime it's in-law, it's through ma- marriage. So that's why, you know, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, it's a catch-all. Okay. You heard it here, folks. Last but not least, what are you looking forward to right now? I'm looking forward to my favorite season of the year, which is the fall and everything that comes with the fall, the coziness, the smells, the back to school nature. I'm not, a, I played football, but like there is something about like football Saturdays in America, premier leagues back coziness, watching movies, I'm Halloween thinking soup. I'm thinking soup, fresh baked bread bread like all the food around fall I'm too like apples like whiskey a nice a nice like you know dark beer chili it's just the best mm. season in the midwest Sounds you nice. know a, a walk along the lake where you have to wear a jacket what and kind a of little jacket wind. like you know just like a thick uh, oh thick not super thick but like th- a, a thick like patagonia or like not you don't have to go full parka what temperature but are we thinking Anywhere between the the 40s and 60s. That's um, a huge range. Like low 60s to, to high 40s. Wow. Kind of that late September, early October. 40s is quite brisk. Yeah, but if like it's in the morning, like the best kind of morning is when it's like it's high 40s and then it gets up into the low 60s. So I'm looking forward to fall and everything that comes with it. Well, thank you so much, Luke. Um, but specifically, thank you to our audience participants, uh, Ted, Jackie. Stephanie, Josie, Tucker, Amy, Dana, Lydia, Greg, Aaliyah, and Erica. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.